uh, what would be the best way of taking an NAD booster? Um, I mean, it seems that in my studies, it's like in the water or injected, right? But you could have sublingual or liposomal or maybe other ways of or maybe a patch even of, of getting it into your skin. Do you have any view on that? Yeah, I mean, um, well, so certainly in our studies, as I've been alluding to, if we give it intravenously in the mice, you know, that's much more effective at delivering either NR or NMN to target tissues compared to oral. Uh, so, so I think that that's a real possibility, but, you know, in terms of both safety um, and the optimal dosing, we're really at the beginning of the process for understanding, you know, whether, when we go intravenous, do we, would we have to dial back the dose because you're actually, you know, getting a much higher effective dose of NR and NMN to those target tissues than what they've seen when you've tried oral dosing for all the safety studies. So I think, I think there's a bit of a reset there. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of other things like, like sublingual or, or patches, um, there's not really much data out there. I think the challenge right now is that the, the doses that are giving, being given orally are, are generally too big to deliver that way. So mm -hmm. if we're right and intravenous dosing is much more effective, um, with low doses, then it may suddenly open up a lot more possibilities to deliver those doses by patch or, or sublingual or nasal sprays or something that, that mm. sort of gets it uh, more directly into the bloodstream than oral. Right. But I think um, the, this theory has to be right, that lower doses will work for any of those routes to be very effective, I think. <laughs> Interesting. But yes, okay. And it does kind of make sense that it would be if you can get it into the blood. I mean, if, if that's... Um, Speaking of dose, I, I mean, typically the dose we take is, is like a, about a gram for a reasonable sized human. Um, does that, so based on mouse dosing, what kind of dosage would you say would be reasonable? Or right, so, so this is a challenge for the field too, because there's a you know, concept called allometric scaling, right? where the, you don't just go by body weight, right? You get a milligram per kilogram dose in the mice, and typically you divide it by about 12 to get the milligram per kilogram dose in humans, um, which is just based on their faster metabolism. Most drugs, they clear faster, and you can use you know, lower doses in, in humans and get the same effective serum concentrations. But in this case, you're actually trying to change the NAD concentration in a given tissue volume. You know, it may not be appropriate to try to use allometric scaling. You may need you know, just as many milligrams per kilogram if you want to have the same effect on NAD levels, which would mean that we just can't achieve in humans the doses that are effective in mice. Um, and I think, you know, on, you know on, on top of that, just being, you know, basically a, you know, candy bars worth of compressed powder that you would have to chew every, every day. Uh, we know that nicotinamide itself starts to get toxic uh, to the liver around three grams a day or higher in humans. And these things are releasing a ton of nicotinamide. You know, so, so that sort of inherently limits how much nicotinamide riboside or mononucleotide might be safe, you know, to, to a few grams. Um, so I think this, this is another big motivation to try to understand, I think, whether intravenous dosing or another strategy is going to be more effective with lower doses, because I think in, in humans, you don't want to go too much higher <laughs> than we're already at, and we probably just can't achieve the rodent doses. Interesting. Yes. No. Uh, okay. Now that makes sense. Okay. So that's kind of like trying to boost. Uh, so an, an alternative strategy would be to try and slow the degradation down, right? Because we, we, we get further degradation. And um, so there's an, a number of proteins, uh, pro enzymes, which uh, degrade NAD, like CD38, PARP, sirtuins, and SARM1, I believe. Yes. Um, so, A, can you talk very briefly about how, how what they do with NAD is different from like the other, the NAD, NADH process? And uh, so which one of those do we think is, is the main kind of culprit in terms of reducing NAD? Yeah, so, so that's uh, actually another big mystery for the field. Um, you know, th there's evidence out there that, you know, especially with CD38, if you inhibit it chronically, that NAD levels go up. Uh, you know, across tissues, particularly in aged or sick animals. Uh, but we've done some experiments taking young, healthy animals and sort of knocking out one enzyme at a time and trying to prove which one is responsible for most of the NAD turnover. Um, 
and I, I'm going to say we haven't clearly found it yet. We really thought with the, either CD38 or PARP1 knockout animals that NAD turnover would slow down a lot. And, and that hasn't been the case with any one enzyme that we've tried yet. Uh, so there's actually quite a few of these that have been poorly studied that are in the PARP family. PARP1 is the, you know, the, the main PARP that, that's been studied that people think about for this stuff. But there's 16 enzymes in that family. Many of them are uh, MARTs. So they're mono ADP ribosyl transferases instead of a poly like, like right. PARP1. Uh, but they're also consuming NAD. And there haven't been reagents for many years to study that modification. So the antibodies people use to study whether PARP activity is up haven't recognized if the MART activity is up. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and so we, we just haven't known much about those family members. So there's a lot of other possibilities about, uh, for what could be the major consumers of NAD that have not really been thoroughly investigated. And I've got to say, the, like I said, the ones that are, would be at the top of your list, we have not so far been able to prove are the major consumer in vivo. For cell culture, mm -hmm. you get a much more expected result, right? You can, you can inhibit sirtuins and you get about a 30% decrease in NAD turnover. And you can inhibit PARPs and get about a 30% decrease in NAD turnover. And you can inhibit both and get about a 60% decrease in turnover. And so, so there's a little bit unaccounted for there. Um, and most cultured cells don't express CD38, including the ones we were studying. So that was out of the picture there. So at least more than half can be accounted for by these obvious pathways in culture. But, but in the animals, they're much more wide open than, than, than what people's impression, including mine, was. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, so the other parts also uh, do DNA repair. Is it the whole family is a DNA repair family, or do they serve some other purpose? Um, no. So, I mean, some of them are involved in DNA repair, and and many of them, the ones that do mono uh, modifications, are, are sort of signaling enzymes, more analogous to to phosphorylation, where you're, you're sort of flicking a switch on. <laughs> uh, but CD thirty uh, eight does increase with age. I understand. I mean, especially it's driven by senescent cells, and we see uh, because there was an experiment with uh, CD, with uh, knockout mouse mice, I believe CD thirty eight knockout mice, that showed that um, NAD levels they seem to be fairly um, okay with NAD levels. So, um, do we, I guess in aging do we see CD thirty eight as being the main cause? Or yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think there's. There's definitely some evidence to support that at this point. So, so the, the model that you alluded to with senescence is that senescent cells um, attract CD38 positive immune cells. CD38 is actually expressed mainly on the, in immune cells and in endothelial cells, so the, the ones that line the blood vessels and tissues. And so most of the like hepatocytes or myocytes, the, the main components of the different tissues don't express CD38 at all. And so when you get this age-related increase, it actually mostly reflects recruiting immune cells into that tissue. It's sort of the inflammatory state of the tissue that is the reason for the CD38 being higher. And senescent cells are one of the main factors that can attract those immune cells into tissue. So as you age, you accumulate a few senescent cells in most tissues and those draw in the immune cell populations which result in more CD38 activity in that tissue. Um, and yeah, in, in aged animals, I think it's a little bit more clear that CD38 starts to become a major consumer and that, that right. there you can boost NAD levels by inhibiting. So you talked about the, the three kind of places where NAD is, mostly in, in the cell, in the nucleus, and in the mitochondria, right, and subsets within that, right? But CD38 is on the cell wall facing outside. So it's reducing intercellular, external uh, NAD. Um, so how does that affect the, set, the NAD within the cell. So this has been yeah, referred to as the topological paradox, right? For CD38 in, in the whole field that it clearly controls NAD levels, um, but is facing the wrong way, like you alluded to. So one partial answer to that is probably that CD38 actually has another activity where it degrades NMN. So mm. it's in mitochondrial which is the precursor to NAD. And I think a big component of what's actually happening now we're starting to understand is that there is extracellular NMN that CD38 is chopping up. So it's not getting into the cell to make NAD, right? Which is a little bit different than the, than the model has been that CD38 is somehow taking the intact synthesized NAD and degrading it, but it really might be cutting off the precursor to a large degree, which can explain, you know, uh, some of why it's having such a big effect on NAD levels, even though it's facing the wrong way, essentially. <laughs> 
reducing CD38 seems to be at least a useful way to try and uh, keep your NAD levels high. And it would certainly seem to be, um, I mean, it's less toxic, right? You're just not using as much. And so it would be, so it seems like a safer way. Right. Well, I mean, there's a plus and a minus to each of these strategies, right? Because whatever enzyme you're inhibiting, including CD38, you know, it does have an endogenous function as well, right? So um, it, it creates a couple of signaling molecules involved in calcium signaling. And so CD38 not get mice have some defects in insulin secretion uh, and are prone to certain infections because it's part of the inflammatory cascade. Uh, and so it's, it's not completely without trade-offs. Yeah. Right. Yes. No, I get that. Um, okay. So... Thank you. So, so the kind of like the third way of the, right would be to so a lot of the NMN gets uh, oh not NMN NAD gets remade by uh, NAMPT right um, through the salvage pathway. Yeah, yeah, it, it gets recovered, and the that the expression of the salvage pathway kind of also goes down with age. Is is that correct? Yeah, so, so so certainly the yeah the mRNA and protein expression of of the of NAMPT itself, which is the the rate limiting enzyme for the salvage pathway, is definitely down with age. Um, I think what's still not clear, you know, is is whether it's down far enough to really be limiting with age. So we see, for instance, if if you knock out one copy of that gene in mice, it barely affects NAD levels. Right? There seems to be excess activity in young animals. So. You know, I think one of the things that's almost certainly happening in the aged animals is your capacity to upregulate that, that pathway is getting limited because the gene expression is going down. Um, so maybe under stressful situations, you won't be able to keep up. But I think I'm not sure that the aged animals ever get, you know, below the point where they can do maintenance level of NAD synthesis. And in fact, that's what our tracer studies that, that aren't out yet, but the, that we've been working on this question with that suggests that in aged animals, um, the level of turnover of NAD is, is relatively constant. It's, it's very similar to young animals. So that implying that they're able to keep synthesizing NAD at the same rate. And it's actually that the degrading enzymes are, are being upregulated a little bit. And that's why the amount of NAD is decreasing. It, it does. It, it seems to have a negative effect. Uh, like if you look at the overall, right, in the end, um, boosting NAD levels seems to make the animals have a longer health span anyway. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and so I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.